Deadly tornadoes across Tennessee, including a midnight twister in the heart of Music City. Power blast, power blast right there. The tornado is coming. There it is. Go inside. Go. The house is shaking. The glass is breaking. It sounds like somebody's shooting a machine gun at the house. Minutes later, an EF4 rips through a nearby town. I started screaming for my wife and kids. He went flying through the air. And when I looked up, my roof was gone. Cookville, Tennessee, 80 miles east of Nashville. This is still a town where people will, you know, drive by you and wave, and you don't even really know who they are. They just wave to be waving. Eric and Faith Johnson live on a quiet road with their 18-month-old son, Uriah, and their daughters, 14-year-old Chloe and 3-year-old Maya. Oh, and don't forget Scooter. Scooter, he's like my first child. He started having children. He was jealous. I've got pictures of me holding my daughter, Maya, and he's right here on my lap because he wanted to be held, too. We got Bella to keep Scooter company. They were our family before we had a family. To the west, in the bustling city of Nashville, Nashville's known as the center of the universe for songwriting in particular. Lives Victoria Banks. I write for the country market and so far kept food on the table for 20 plus years. Her husband Dave is also a musician. We have two little girls that we were blessed to adopt and one of them is two, she's Evie, and the five-year-old is Alexa. March 2nd, 2020. A supercell forms near the Mississippi River in West Tennessee and begins to advance eastward. Henry Rothenberg is a meteorologist for News Channel 5 in Nashville. Our anticipation was gonna be heavy downpours, damaging wind, and even large hail. And everything looked like it would be north of us. At 5.20 p.m., a tornado watch is issued across the region. Severe weather so late in the day can be especially dangerous. Tornadoes that strike from midnight to sunrise are two and a half times as likely to kill. When the sun goes down, the danger level just skyrockets. You cannot see the tornado with the naked eye. You need the power flashes that may occur as it's hitting power lines or power structures. It's 8 p.m. in Victoria and Dave's East Nashville neighborhood. We'd read the girls their bedtime stories and sang their lullabies. They tuck the girls into bed and head to their own bedroom downstairs. It's bedtime in Cookville, too. I remember looking out thinking, I thought it was going to storm. It was very quiet, no rain, no nothing. The Johnson's teenage daughter is staying with relatives. Everyone else is sleeping with mom and dad, including Scooter. Bella claims her usual position under the bed. Bella is a very protective dog. We always felt safe at night with Bella at home because we knew that any noise that she knew was not normal, she would alert us to it. 10, 12 p.m. A small EF-1 tornado touches down in West Tennessee. Within minutes, there's another one nearby. Henry Rothenberg watches the radar as a third tornado, an EF-2, forms about 90 miles west of Nashville. You start to see that storm develop this perfect hook echo, which is how we can pick out a classic tornado on radar. And I remember thinking, I don't like the way this looks. 11.20 p.m. A fourth tornado strikes the western outskirts of Nashville. 
With winds over 160 miles per hour, it speeds east toward the city. I was looking at radar thinking, if that's where I think it is, then with enough lightning strikes, I should be able to see this. Henry enlists the help of a cameraman on staff, and they head for the loading dock exit with the camera rolling. It was almost like a movie. The second I open the door and walk out, lightning. Power blast, power blast right there. The tornado is coming. My man. There it is. Go, inside. Now, get inside, folks. This is moving by the Channel 5 area as we speak. This is a direct hit. This is the inside of the tornado right now. The outer part of the vortex itself was actually scraping the television station. Onlookers film the tornado as it tears through North Nashville. Well, there is, there is a tornado on the north side of Germantown. I don't like it. I don't like it. As the twister churns through the city, homes are left tattered in its wake. In East Nashville, Victoria is awakened by the lightning. There was bright lightning flashing. It was almost like someone was turning on a light in the room. It was that bright. Within seconds, she and her husband, Dave, hear sirens in the distance. My husband walked to the back window and looked out in the yard. And then all of a sudden, I hear this sound that's like a freight train. And he goes, here come the trees. The house is shaking, the glass is breaking. And my first thought is my kids are up there in the back and they're all windows in their rooms. The burglar alarm starts going on in the house because of the broken glass. The fire alarm starts going off too. I start running immediately to get the kids. And the second I start running toward them, my husband at the same time comes running around the corner and we collide at a full run, my forehead to his nose. It broke his nose instantly, knocked him on the ground. I looked down, his nose was over to the side of his face and there was blood everywhere. But Victoria can't stop. She's on a mission to reach their children and make sure they're alive. And I'm just going, oh my God, I gotta get the kids, I gotta get the kids. And I literally jump over my husband, leave him lying on the ground and I run up the staircase. I get to the door that leads to my kids' rooms. And I remember that moment in slow motion, putting my hand on the doorknob and not knowing if there's gonna be anything on the other side of it. It is hitting Channel 5. It is hitting our TV station at this time, moving through our parking lot. March 3rd, 2020, just after midnight. Meteorologist Henry Rothenberg and a cameraman film an EF3 tornado as it roars through Nashville, Tennessee. A very large tornado that was moving through the area, very wide tornado base. All right, folks, you need to head to your safe place. This tornado at this time is going in an easterly direction. 80 miles east in Cookville, Eric Johnson is awakened by a noise under the bed. Bella woke me up. She woke me up whining, I mean, hysterically whining. And she continued on and on. I woke my wife up and said, do you hear? What should I do now? She always slept under our bed. We knew she didn't have to go out. Our second thought was, it must be going to storm. I walked out on my deck. It was lightning way off the distance. You could see debris in the air. It was lightning like I had never seen. It was green. The sky was green. The weird and crazy thing is, is it was not raining. There was no hail. It was very quiet other than seeing a little bit of debris in the distance. Bella, she was still whining. She would not get up and come up from under that bed. 
at their home in East Nashville, Victoria Banks and her husband had only seconds before the twister was upon them. It almost sounded like the house being peppered with bullets, like somebody shooting at the house. When the tornado hit, two-year-old Evie and five-year-old Alexa were asleep in their bedrooms upstairs. And as soon as we heard the glass break, we knew that it could be bad up there. I felt this guilt because we're downstairs in this room that's, you know, safe, and they're upstairs, and the storm hit them first. I opened that door, and I could see my five-year-old daughter, and she's okay. She's sitting there, and the room is windy. When the trees came flying at the house, they came flying right at the kids' rooms. Her bed is right next to a window. Every single tree in our backyard had not just fallen, but had projectiled into our house and broken all their windows. I grab her in one arm and I run to my two-year-old who's also sitting in her little room crying. Victoria and her now injured husband, Dave, carry their children to the bathroom for shelter and wait for the storm to pass. The tornado siren is still going on. Our phones just kind of stopped working. We were just waiting until the sun came up. The tornado that just struck East Nashville continues to tear through the city. The tornado went through the Five Points area, damaging businesses, restaurants. It was on the ground for about 60 miles. Finally, the tornado lifts, but only for a moment, before the supercell drops yet another twister. This one, an EF4 monster moving directly toward Cookville. A Cookville resident captures this dash cam video of the tornado's brutal power as it marches past his home. around 175 miles per hour that is five football fields wide. In Cookville, Faith and Eric Johnson have just been awakened by their dog, Bella, whining under the bed. It wasn't until Bella woke us up that we knew something was not quite right. I saw my phone light up and it said tornado warning. Our children are in our bed asleep, sound asleep. My dog Scooter was sitting on the bed, and Bella is still under the bed, not coming out. I was always told the bathtub was the safest place, so we took both of them in the bathtub with me. We wrapped them in blankets. My son had a sippy cup, and of course, they're half asleep. Eric decides to run back and try to coax the dogs into the bathroom with the rest of the family. And that's when I heard the tornado in our backyard. And I screamed at him and said, you got to come now. When I got to our master bedroom, I could actually hear homes off in the cul-de-sac being just destroyed. And the whole house was lifting. My wife yells, you have to come now. And I ran. When I got to them, I literally dove on top of my wife and kids. And I told my wife, I said, just hold on because it's here. Our house literally exploded. He didn't even have time to lock his arms around us when the tornado had already taken our house. And it sucked him out. I'm sorry. He went flying through the air. And when I looked up, our roof was gone. Our house was gone. Cookville, Tennessee. An EF4 tornado is ripping apart the house where Eric and Faith Johnson are taking cover in the bathroom with their children. My husband said, hold on, it's here. He was on top of his, and it sucked him out in front of our very eyes, like a feather in the wind. I remember having my eyes open the whole time. It looked like something, you were in tunnel vision. 
As the tornado pulls Eric into the sky, the tub holding Faith and the children is flung into the darkness. I kept praying to God the entire time. Please, God, don't let me lose my children. I waited so long in life to have them. Please don't let me lose them. The bathtub flies onto a mound of debris. Nearby, Eric wakes up alone and disoriented. In that moment, I started screaming for my wife and kids. I could hear her say, hey, Eric, we're over here, and I'm kind of catch myself. Do I really hear her? She was just sitting there, both of my kids holding them. The little boy had no clue what even happened. He still had a green sippy cup in his hand. He didn't have a scratch or bruise on his entire body, except his ribs were actually bruised a little bit from where I held on so tight. Eric has a deep cut on his head, and Faith has two broken ribs. Three-year-old Maya is unharmed. One of the first words out of my daughter's mouth, she said, Mommy, our house is broken. Back in East Nashville, my five-year-old for a long time was chattering, like her teeth were chattering. But eventually they fell asleep and the sun came up. And I walked outside in my bathrobe and I just couldn't believe it when I opened the front door. Roofs totally off that house. Everybody's windows are blown out. Our place is somehow unscathed on the front. The girls' uh, rooms got smashed in, the windows got smashed in. This is my daughter's room. All three windows broken, glass all in here. She was sleeping right here. And then this is my other daughter was sleeping right here. And the window broke, but only the outside. All I can think is just by the grace of God, something protected those children. Ten tornadoes touch down across Tennessee. 25 people are killed. 19 in Cookville. Just wasn't our time to yo yet. You know, that's the only way I can explain it. The day after the storm, Eric Johnson finds the body of their family dog, Scooter. And Bella, who woke them up moments before the tornado struck, is missing. Bella is what gave us a chance to, you know, if it wasn't for her, we would have slept right through it. Thousands of volunteers arrive in Nashville and Cookville to aid in the cleanup efforts. Volunteers are also on the hunt for Bella. Strangers would text us and say, hey, I'm out looking for Bella. A lady from this church, she works for the Big Fluffy Dog Rescue. She immediately started um, setting up a live trap and trail cams in places she had been seen. 54 days after the tornado, the Johnsons receive word that Bella has been found by the Big Fluffy Dog Rescue, six miles from their house. It was uh, a huge relief. He just broke down and cried because he was so happy. We knew we lived in a great community, but we just didn't realize how great it was until this happened. Seeing how generous people were blew me away. You can't help but see all of the beauty in what people do to respond to it. And I hope that that will find its way into my music too. When the sky falls down, puts a crack across your sacred ground. Everything you built your world around ain't strong enough. When foundations shake and you're shattered by a twist of fate, there's only one thing that'll never break. Hold on to love. That's what you do as a songwriter. You try to find the light in the story. Coming up, a dust storm sweeps across the desert. 
epic kaboob right here. Engulfing a city and triggering a tempest. It was just like a cyclone in the house. How high is the water? I did not move. A gigantic dust storm engulfs an entire city. You can see it coming. You can see it moving across buildings. And this wall of dust is like five to 6,000 feet high. Unleashing monsoon rains and flash floods. 911 emergency. While a car plummets into a canal, trapping a woman inside. Hey, uh, there, there's a car that slipped over in the canal. With only minutes to spare. Is the water still flooding in, inside your vehicle? All I could think was, how am I going to help this lady? Mesa, Arizona. In the Sonoran Desert, 18 miles east of Phoenix. An oasis for sun worshipers and the Chicago Cubs spring training camp. While people associate the desert with clear blue skies, the area gets its fair share of storms. In the summer, we have our monsoon season. Arizona gets torrential downpours, uh, microbursts, flash flooding is a huge concern. Mike Olbinski is captivated by weather. The Arizona native is both a professional photographer and storm chaser. And my dad had a fascination with weather. I'm pretty sure that's where I got it from. We would sit outside and watch lightning storms here in the desert. Monday, July 9th, 2018. A powerful low pressure system spins westward across New Mexico toward Arizona, setting the stage for storms to develop over the desert. Mike is on a family trip in California, but he's keeping tabs on the weather back home. I knew, looking at the models, we are gonna get big storms through Phoenix and we could get a big dust storm. There's just average dust storms and then there's the haboobs, which are just like, like wall of dust. A haboob is a mega-sized dust storm. It comes from an Arabic word meaning blowing furiously and it's triggered by the collapse of a thunderstorm. For the most part, you need thunderstorms to build up and you need them to have strong downbursts that slam in the ground. As the storm hits the dry desert, it releases precipitation and wind that gusts outward, creating a monstrous wall of dust. And then it just kind of is like a living organism for hundreds of miles. Mike packs up his kids, nine-year-old Lila and six-year-old Eli, and heads back to Arizona, hoping to witness and film a haboob. I told my kids, okay, we gotta get home. We're gonna get daddy's camera gear, hit Phoenix later in the day. I'm teaching them, like, it doesn't have to be a scary thing if you know what you're doing and be safe. So off to another adventure. <laughs> Joseph Frey and his family have lived in Mesa for four generations. My mom, Miss Ellen, <laughs> my mom is amazing. She was the first African-American female teacher at uh, Falcon Elementary School. Now Joseph cares for his 75-year-old mother, who is partially paralyzed from a stroke. They live in an adobe house built by their family back in 1947. That year, my, my mother was five years old they planted the tree, the pine tree, in the front of our house. Today, Joseph's niece and nephew are visiting. They were gonna leave, but they decided to stay because we saw the storm coming in. I'm like, ooh, this is gonna be a bad one. You could see the rain that was coming down in the dark clouds. Nothing that seems out of the ordinary for monsoon season. It's Arizona. It's gonna rain for about 15 minutes, and then it's gonna be dry as a bone. But not this time. All right, we got a storm here. It was like some rain and hail falling, some dust over here on these mountains. When we were chasing, we, you know, and I say we, me and my kids were with me, and there was mother chasers out. There was a huge wall of storms. Look at that. 
I know. You can just see the dust starting getting picked up all over the place. but starting to look intense. Within minutes, it became a monster. Epic kaboob right here. This thing is unbelievable. Wow, 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 wow. Eli, what do you think? Holy By late afternoon, the outer fringe of an immense haboob enters the Phoenix metro area. You could see the sky in the distance was getting darker out the window at work. At the Mesa 911 center, veteran dispatcher Julie Briones is at the end of her shift. You never really know what you're going to get in this job. Every day is different. There's no two that are the same. One thing you can count on, when a storm hits, the number of calls skyrocket. I asked the supervisor when I was leaving, I said, if you'd like, I can stay over if we're going to get busy. And she said, no, go ahead and go. 18 miles west in Phoenix, the haboob arrives. It collides with humid air, triggering a band of storms. Those storms roll into Mesa, packing thunder, lightning, and heavy rain. The weather here changed to be in the blink of an eye. We received a downpour of rain. I couldn't even see to walk out the door anyway to find my car. So Julie turns around and goes back to her desk. I threw my headset on, plugged into the console, and started answering calls. Okay. While waiting for the storm to pass, Joseph Frey is writing out his weekly to-do list. My mother was in her bedroom watching TV. I sat down, went to grab the pen, and a huge, loud boom just happened. Blew the front door open, blew the windows open. And it was just like a cyclone in the house, just air just whipping around. Then the wind dies down. Joseph makes sure the kids are OK and checks on his mom. She's fine. Her window blew open, went and closed everything. And it had only been like less than five minutes. And then all of a sudden, you hear your mom scream. That's when. That's when the tree fell in it. Sorry. That's when the tree fell. The 150-foot pine tree that stood outside their house for four generations has just crashed right through the roof. It literally almost split my mother's room in half. Joseph and his nephew struggle to force open her bedroom door. On the other side of the door, the whole ceiling is caved in. She has these mint green walls, and you're looking at the ground, and you're seeing mint green. There's smoke and dust and debris. And you look up and you're seeing the sky and you're seeing the rain come in. And next thing you know, you see this tree on your mother's back. And you see it impaled through her leg. Epic Haboob is carving a path through the Arizona desert. All right, get in the car, buckle up. Photographer Michael Bell. Binsky and his kids are on the chase to film it. We're going to be hit by this dust storm at any minute. It was fun to have them as part of it. My daughter was running around with the camera, and I got this photo of my son on top of the car with his hands up and this monster wall of dust um, coming behind him. Despite its majestic beauty, the Haboob triggers a band of violent thunderstorms, dumping an inch of rain in the city of Mesa. Then it's gone, and the sun is out. At the home that Joseph Ray shares with his disabled mother, a 150-foot pine tree has smashed through the roof. The adobe from the house is turning into mud, and it's falling over her and this tree is in her leg, you just see it impaled. That's when our lives got turned upside down. Panel C-Deck 2 is clear. 
At the Mesa 911 Center, dispatcher Julie Briones is getting flooded with calls. I was taking calls where the carports were blowing off into sides of buildings and on top of cars, lines down across the street and trees that had blown down across the roads. Then the Mesa Police Department patches her in with a caller. What is happening? I'm like a fucking in the water. I cannot drive. Where are you at? I'm like a, where are you at? In my school in Bala. She said that water was coming in her car. And at that point, I was trying to make confirm that she was at that location. Oh my god. Okay, I need you to try to stay calm. What is your first language? While Julie speaks with the caller, others are phoning in about the same vehicle submerged in a nearby irrigation canal. 911 emergency. Hey, uh, there, there's a car that slipped over in the canal on uh, Alma School and Bass Pro Shop Drop that's going under. I could hear the water coming in the car rather swiftly, and it was, was rising. How high is the water? Is it coming into your vehicle? Julie keeps the woman on the line as she contacts the Mesa Fire Department. Can you have fire start for Alma School in Rio Salado? I was just trying my best to keep her alive, keep her calm, keep her talking to me. Stay on the phone, okay? Don't hang up. Stay on the phone, don't hang up. She had spoken that she does not know how to swim, and that's when I began to panic because we were on emergency calls all over the city. Meryl Brimley lives near the irrigation canal. I hear sirens just going crazy, and I knew they were close by. I got here, and there was a car submerged in water, totally submerged. You just see the top of it. As officers arrive, Merrill records the scene on his phone. I don't even know why it was recorded. I actually thought it might be empty. Three miles east, Joseph Frey fights through the dust and debris to help his mother. This was a huge tree. The first thing we tried to do was lift it up. I don't know why we thought we could lift it up. My younger nephew was like, somebody get a crane. I'm like, brings you back to reality. Do you got a crane? I don't have a crane. I don't keep a crane in the backyard. And I grab my phone and I call 911. Nearby with Mesa Fire is Special Operations Captain Dean Morales. A call came in where a tree had fallen over into a house. And I was en route to that call. That's when he learns about another emergency. Do you have a unit on the scene yet for that water rescue on Alma School and Bass Pro Drive? That's negative, not yet. I was probably about a mile from that call, and so I made the decision to switch my response and respond to the car in the canal. Is the water still flooding in, inside your vehicle? Is it coming higher? <laughs> Captain Morales arrives to find a car submerged in the canal. But no one on the scene knows if the vehicle is occupied. Nobody had actually saw the car enter the canal. We don't want to get anybody hurt over an abandoned car. But dispatcher Julie Briones knows something they don't. A woman is trapped inside, and time is running out. My supervisor was walking behind me, and I, I took a deep breath, and I said, I think I just heard this lady take her last breath. Ma'am, are you still there? All right, I don't have... Uh, yeah, she... Yeah, I'll, she hung up. In July 2018, a monstrous haboob churns across the Arizona desert. Oh, this is the biggest dust storm we've got yet! Look, look, look. Oh my gosh, we're inside the dust storm. You guys are packing up. 
Taking it. The storm tears through the city of Mesa with a burst of high winds and heavy rain, leaving behind a wake of destruction. Amid the storms, a vehicle has careened into an irrigation canal. The water level was above the roof level of the car. Fire Department Captain Dean Morales weighs the risks of sending an officer into the water. We have a car that's unstable. If the vehicle moves, you don't want the firefighter to be sucked underneath the vehicle. And then a Mesa ladder truck showed up on the scene and they said, did you hear the radio traffic that the caller is inside the car? So now that completely changes our strategy. There's no time to wait. If there's somebody in this car, and this car is completely submerged, we will risk a lot to save a lot. One of the firefighters enters the water without hesitation. Bystander Merrill Brimley captures the scene on his mobile phone. As the firemen got into the car, he said, viable. So I knew that they had somebody who was alive in the car. You know, obviously this is a miracle to be in a submerged car for that long to be alive was just something I wasn't expecting to see. She was alert and oriented. We knew at that point she was gonna be okay. But just the thought process, it hit me in the gut so hard uh, thinking about what could have been. Three miles east, a rescue team has arrived at Joseph Frey's mother's house. They had to stabilize my mother first, and then they had to cut the limb above her to get her out with a chainsaw. They were able to take it off quickly. It didn't break any of the bone in her thigh or anything. It just went into flesh. If she had been sitting six inches to the right, the rest of the trunk of the tree would have crushed her. So divine intervention, I don't care what anybody else believes, but God was looking out for her. That evening, 60 miles southwest of Mesa, storm chaser Mike Oblinsky and his kids continue to chase the haboob as it blows across the desert for nearly 200 miles. This was a special chase for me because I had my two, you know, kids with me, Lila and Eli. Here, we'll do a haboob selfie, okay? Whoa! It started getting dark and we went to Yuma and just sat and let it hit us in the dark. Man, it was one of my favorite chases of all time. Dispatcher Julie Briones leaves her shift that day without ever learning what happened to the woman in the canal. I chose to not watch the news that night. When the call dropped and I thought that she had passed away, it's so hard to explain. Um, you feel kind of a heaviness, like I didn't do enough. When she arrives to work the following morning, she's greeted by a round of applause. My coworker started clapping when I came in and said, hey, good job on saving the lady in the canal. And I was completely shocked. I didn't know that she had survived. And I just thought, oh, thank God that family didn't suffer last night losing her. The woman rescued from the canal entered the hospital as a quote, Jane Doe, meaning that for whatever reason, she requested to remain anonymous. We know she survived and was released from the hospital. But to this day, even to the emergency response team that rescued her, her identity remains a total mystery. It's just a question mark as far as that goes. Maybe I'll run into her someday and not even know it's her. As the firefighters and rescuers, you know, we never expect to, to hear thank yous. We do what we do because we love what we do. Two years after the storm, Miss Ellen has recovered. But Joseph Frey and his family are still trying to rebuild their ancestral home. My mother wants to go back 
to where she was raised and where she was born. And so that's our main focus right now. The family has a GoFundMe page to help raise money for the rebuilding. This was a close call, but to come out on the other end, to see such amazing people, first responders, people from the neighborhood come out and help. It's what we need more of, especially now. It didn't matter what political affiliation you were with. It didn't matter where you grew up. You were someone that in their hour of need, someone stepped up and helped.